will as we enter the story of Jonah. So we read these words together. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came to him and said, What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we may not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am Hebrew, he said. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. It's the word of God for the people of God. Small piece 
of what y'all are already up to. So thank you for allowing me in your midst and the opportunity to share a few things with you this morning. And I'd like to begin this time of sharing by offering a confession of sorts. They, they say confession is good for the soul, so we'll see how this works out. Something you may or may not know already about me, but I am an impatient person. I do not wait particularly well. This is something my wife will readily attest to. I, I am not one who waits with any sort of quiet dignity. If we find ourselves in line at the grocery store or the checkout line, and by line I need more than one person in front of us in line, I will get particularly fidgety. I think the magazines that they put there at the checkout line were put there especially for me. Uh, I have learned more about the Kardashians from the grocery store than I ever thought I would, so I am thankful for people and for those kind of magazines. Uh, if we are experiencing particularly slow service at a restaurant, which seems to happen to us more than any other couple I have ever met in my entire life, I will have to do something. I will tap my fork on the table, I will shuffle my feet, I will check Sports Center for the 25th time on my cell phone, I will do something to just pass the time. And then Deb, she'll say to me in those moments, she'll go, you're fidgeting. To which I'll be like, yes, dear. And I'll grab the whole and kind of, you know, kind of do something else. Which, of course, will be lost for a few seconds, right? And you get right back to where you were before. I do not play the waiting game well. And I would imagine if I asked you to raise your hands, and don't worry, I won't, but if I were to ask you to acknowledge who of you waits particularly well, there wouldn't be very many of us that would actually readily put our hands up. We, we tend to be an impatient people. We, we tend to like things to happen at a fairly brisk pace, and when things don't happen on our terms, we start to get fidgety. And of course we know this, but the problem with waiting is that we are so often always at the mercy of somebody else. Right? See, not often do we find ourselves waiting on ourselves. We're always waiting on somebody else, right? You know, at the grocery store, for example, we are held hostage to slow moving checkout clerks or those people that have to price check every single item as it goes across the conveyor belt. And if, if that's you, don't worry, I still love you, but know that I am fidgeting behind you in line. You know, if we go to the bank, we are held hostage to what teller wants to make themselves available at that moment, or what loan officer wants to get off their computer or their phone and talk to us. You know, if we go to Starbucks, we are waiting on barista trainees, or the person that will bun in front of everybody else in line and order 17 no web extra hot mocha frappuccinos with no mocha. You know, you know those people, right? And they, will, of course, won't apologize for what they were doing. You know, we go to the post office. We are forced to wait on government employees who are made available in the most obscenely bizarre logic imaginable. You know, at the post office in Pasadena, there would be like six or seven or eight windows, one teller. Right? Okay, we know that moment as well. And of course, sometimes, it's not people we are waiting on. Sometimes other things, other things to happen. Zach, for example, currently finds it exasperating to wait for the stoplight to turn from red to green so he can, we can get out of here, he says, to get away from the polar bears and the giants that freely roam the neighborhoods around our house. Daddy, Did you know that current estimates say that we will spend two years of our life doing nothing but waiting? Waiting for something. And perhaps more than anything, perhaps more than people, or perhaps more than technology to do its thing, we wait for events. You know what I mean? Right? We're waiting for something to come, something to happen, a, a birthday maybe, or a wedding day, or an anniversary, a graduation day, or the day where our kids or grandkids will finally head off to college. You know, I've never been more fixated on waiting my entire life. We counted down the day before Zach and now Josh was born. And of course, right now, though, I will confess to you that a close second in that waiting game is counting down the days until the Royals play again. <laughs> hey, at least I got that order right. 
of something to happen is something that our world, our culture, has really grabbed hold upon. Advertisers, for example, take advantage of this tension better than anybody. There is a psychology to advertising, and it's something that plays upon this tension. If you were to listen to almost any ad on TV or on the radio or great in the coverage of our magazines, it tells us to get ready for something that's going to come. There's actually a cell phone company whose, whose motto right now is the next big thing. You know how there's always something else coming down the chute. You know, we'll read and hear these ads for a sale at a car lot. You know, we'll start hearing about Christmas sales now in October. Uh, you know, we'll hear about the coming unveiling of the iPhone 27 or, or whatever it is now. When it come down to the next big football game, the rock concert, or the other marquee event, if you turn on Sports Center or something on Saturday morning, it will actually have a clock going at the bottom of the screen, counting down the minutes and even seconds until kickoff of the next game. 27 minutes and 12 seconds to kickoff. And for many, <coughs> this hope for a new reality. The hope for something else or new to happen becomes our life. Waiting for something else to happen, something to change our fortunes, something to change our, our reality. You know, it was John Lennon who said that life is what happens when you're busy making other and for many, life is what's happening while we are busy waiting for our next big thing, our next big moment. But what happens when the time comes? What happens when our moment is thrust and to the forefront of our senses. And we are finally given the opportunity to claim that very thing that we have so long for. It is this question that will guide us in this time of sharing together as we meet the man named Jonah. And you know, we know very little about Jonah. We know very little about his background or his upbringing. We don't know much about him, which of course leaves everything to the imagination, which is really fun and really dangerous at the exact same time. But I, I picture Jonah as a father, as a, a young man, perhaps in his early to middle teenage years, knee deep in the work of keeping his father's farm up and running. You know, I kind of have the image of Luke Skywalker in my head. If you remember the original Star Wars movie, there's that scene where, I'm a Star Wars geek, you'll learn this about me, I really love the Star Wars movies, uh, where Luke is there on Tatooine, and he's on the moisture farm, and he's looking out into the horizon, and he sees the two suns that are setting in the picture of the scene, right? And John Williams' his music is going in the background, and, and he's kind of staring longingly, thinking something big is going to happen even as he stares off into the desert. I picture Jonah in the same way, doing the same thing day in, day out, bored out of his mind, desiring nothing more than to be part of something bigger, to be part of something better, just having no idea what it was. And it's often the case, when that moment comes, when our opportunity arises to us, it comes suddenly, it comes without warning, it comes unexpectedly, and certainly this was the case for Jonah. You can imagine the scene as our story begins today. Jonah is out in the fields, 
you know, throwing leaves or something. When all of a sudden, God shows up. We read that the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. You can picture the scene, can't you? You can picture Jonah hearing that call, and you probably can imagine his response. Wait. What? You want me to do what? With who? When did you say this was going to happen? I got, I got weeds to pull. You know, Jonah is often portrayed as a man who at best is fearful, who is scared about the task that God has put upon him. And at worst, he is portrayed as a disobedient man, a man who willingly chooses to do the exact opposite, and he's kind of a model of disobedience. But I will tell you that I don't picture Jonah as either one of those two. I see Jonah in the same way that I think most of us see ourselves. I know I see Jonah as I see myself. Not, not really scared. Not intentionally disobedient. He just wasn't ready. He had this deep longing within himself. And then again, that moment comes, like, wait a minute, I, I didn't sign up for this. I, I got things to do. We may understand. We may begin to connect with Jonah now on this level because we may have this deep longing within us. This desire to do and to be a part of something great. But life sometimes gets in the way, doesn't it? You know, we, we have lives, we have our own realities, we, we have families, we, we have obligations, we, we have bills to pay, we have things to do. And in this way, Jonah's story becomes our story. And we weave them together into God's story. And that struggle is okay. Let us not for a moment think that we are not allowed to exist in that vision. That is a part of what it means to be a disciple in this world. And it's not something that we need to lament or something that we need to feel bad about. And it works out okay because while the world around us tells us that these big moments come only once in a lifetime, either you see it now or you're going to miss it Forever, this, this is not always the case. And I believe that there are different opportunities, different kinds of opportunities that present themselves throughout this life. And through the, for the sake of simplicity, we can kind of divide them into two big categories. On one side, we have what we call the me moments. You know, those things that come up that we can do to make ourselves better, or at least think that we're better. This is the, the classes we can take. This is the job opportunity that may only come once. This is the iPhone to buy. This is the rock concert to go to. This is the, the me moment. Good things, viable things, important things, but things that benefit us. And then over here on the other side, we have what we might call God moments. And there is a big difference between the two. A me moments do only come once in a lifetime, but then in God moments, they are set apart by the reality that God moments tend to circle back around over and over and over again, presenting themselves in different ways until we are either uncomfortable enough or at peace enough, I'm not really sure which it is, with our own spirit that we are finally then able to open ourselves up to the call that has been placed.
placed upon us. Can you recognize the difference between the two? Maybe you can think about moments that have come up in your life where you have gotten that sense, that tingling, funny feeling in your gut and in your spine that God is trying to do something really, really cool within you. You don't know how to explain it. You don't know how to justify it. You don't even know what it means. But you just know that God is up to something. This week I've been thinking a lot about opportunities that have come up in my life that I have initially been unwilling or unable to immediately say yes to. You know, we say things like, I'm not ready. I have other things I want to do. God was and is persistent. And not only that, but I think this is the good news. It's good for me. It's good for you. It's good for Jonah. That God is also patient. God, God knows how to It's the truth that Jonah will later proclaim in the book. He says, you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So when the God moment comes for Jonah, when his call to ministry is placed before him, he does the natural, instinctual thing, the thing that probably most of us would do in a similar circumstance, runs as far away from it as he could. He hops on that boat and he heads to Tarshish. By the way, that is probably one of the hardest cities to say in the entire Bible. And when you say it like six times in two sentences, that says it comes from Tarshish. God will never find me here. He must have thought to himself, probably pretty self-importantly and righteously. God never find me here. Of course, forgetting the words of the psalmist, if you remember Psalm 139, where the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Can't hide from God. But this is not the end of the story. If it were, if that were the end of the story, if the story of Jonah ended by hopping on that boat, this story and this call would not have come from God. You know, when the call is met with a hesitant response, God simply tries again. And again. And again and again and again. As many times as necessary. <clears throat> and perhaps, maybe, just maybe, we, you and me, we can recognize that truth for ourselves. Recognizing first that we all are called participate in the building up of the kingdom of heaven, recognizing that we all have been called to ministry. You know that, right? Every single one of you are ministers. You do remember that. We're doing ministry together now. Perhaps we have gotten that tingling feeling that God wants to do something great in us and through us. At first,
God screwed up on this one. Maybe if God can't find me to do this, he'll pick that guy or that girl over there, somebody that's more capable for his task. We've all been there, right? You think, who am I to do the work of kingdom building? And it is in those moments of self doubt when we ask that question of ourselves, who am I? Where God will always throw it back into our face by asking us the same question, saying, who am I? See, God doesn't make mistakes. And when God puts a task or a call or a ministry on our hearts, God means it. And God knows what he's doing. <laughs> the annoyingly awesome thing about God moments is they continue to circle back around into our faces over and over and over again. And Jonah, his second opportunity came in the form of that great fish. Now remember, it was not a whale that swallowed up Jonah. It was a great fish. So next time you're on Bible Jeopardy, remember, great fish, not whale. And it was in that fish where God's patience is on full display. The storm, the fish, these are not signs of God's anger or God's wrath, but a sign that God was willing to wait Jonah out. See, there was no threat involved with Jonah's call. God did not say to Jonah, go to Nineveh or I will have this fish eat you. But instead, God provided the fish as an opportunity for Jonah to consider his own heart and his own willingness to fulfill the task that has been set before him. And I know this might seem strange, but often I think of the church, the book, as the belly of the fish. I picture every single one of us considering together who we are, what we are, whose we are, and the ministry that has been placed upon us. This is our time to discern and to listen for God's voice again. So what is it for you? What is the call, the ministry, the life that God has called and placed upon you? What are you running from? What are you hesitant to say yes to? I wonder. And what is keeping you from simply saying?